I mean, I mean, obviously, the, the, the blues is very much a product of its day. But what was it? That, you know, who was it that you were trying to write in the style of way back then? Well, she's my girl. Was my idol was Richie Valens. Yeah. The, the, uh, La Bamba. I, I actually auditioned for Delphi simply because I wanted to meet Richie yeah. Valens. Yeah. Um, yeah. It was, uh, it was after uh, it was Richie Valens and uh, Bill Pittman played the uh, the same bass. You know, really? boom, you know that uh, it's called a tenor uh, a tenor bass. And the other side was uh, my other idol. Ricky Nelson. So, if you believe in me, it was the, uh, the A side. I don't know which. I think she's my girl turned out to be uh, the A side. It was the A side. Memory was it the A side? Right. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Memory serves me well. Okay, yes. so they went for the upbeat too. Yeah. The other was more yeah. like uh, Ricky Nelson. Um, mm. yeah. yeah, and you were what, 15 when you were there? Yeah, 14 and a half, 15. So, you pretty just. Um, then, uh, we're, we're skipping a couple of months now, you started to work with Darlene Love of all people before you started working with Betty Everett, but Darlene Love, I mean, was this pre-Spectre Love, or was this, had she already signed for Phillies by then? Uh, refresh my memory, where was I working um, with Darlene Love on? Uh, just before, can I get to know you better, uh, with Betty Everett, you did cut a couple of demos with That's Darlene right. Love. Yes. Um, I was looking to get, I was looking to get a record with Jerry Butler, and uh, Betty Everett, a duo, uh, a duet. So I wrote a couple songs called just I think one of them was called "Love Me." It was a demo. And uh, and Darlene mm -hmm. uh, was faith. Yes, I mean the uh, he's a rebel. Yes, had already been out. Yeah, that would get out. Of it. Yes, it right. already been out. So yeah, working with her. Um, you have to understand that. Uh, the artists that we have this tremendous love and respect for uh, really weren't getting paid anything. So Darlene was a working girl and she would do sessions for uh, $15. Right. You know, and that was about the money, all the money that you could afford to do a, a demo session with. Um, oh. What chills and fever you get. Well, the Phil was notorious for not paying anybody at any time. Yes. Yes. That the truth came out, uh, you know, which no one would want to believe. Mm. You, know, it's, mm. it's, you know, it's like the mad uncle. Oh, um, seriously, was wasn't it? Yeah, yeah, seriously, he was the Uncle Fester of Los Angeles of the Rewards. And um, can I get to know you better? Obviously, we played two versions of that today. One by uh, Mark Winter, and obviously the one by the Turtles. We'll come on to the Turtles a bit later. Okay. But uh, um, I want to move on now to kick that little foot, Sally Ann, uh, which has an, an inordinate amount of references. Slossom. Which is, you know, a peculiar, a peculiar. I mean, it means nothing to me. I know real building, but should I, should I understand that reference? Um, it's sort of like the Bristol Stomp. Uh, it's sort of like, uh, it's a reference to a street in Los Angeles that uh, the black teenagers uh, would congregate. And it, uh, they began to do a, uh, a dance right. uh, on the street, and it's sort of like you know the twist, the mashed potato. Okay. Uh, it okay. became a phenomenon in Los Angeles, and so Slauson is the dividing line, pretty much between the black area and the white area oh, in those okay. days. Okay. So Slauson Avenue became uh, the name of the dance. Do the Slauson. Right. Oh, okay. So that's the, oh, okay. that's the point of so reference. It, it was a bit like a bit like the pony or something like that, but it was regional to it's, the extreme. Exactly. Fantastic. And then you started. You, you put in a track called "Pipe Piping Music" with Lloyd Thaxton. Now, to most people in Britain, Lloyd Thaxton is, is a name that you don't really conjure with much. I mean, I knew him because he recorded a track with Gary Usher called "Image of a Circle," uh, way probably you know, late '64. But um, I was reading your wonderful tome, uh, and then went off to Google Lloyd Thaxton to find out he was actually quite an established star over the other side of the pond. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, how was it that he, uh, uh, he approached you to, to, to work with you? Uh, Round Robin was on Domain Records. Mm -hmm. uh, Lloyd had a regional hit television show similar to a dance party teenage dance party show, small version of American Bandstand, right. regional for Los Angeles. 
Um, Big Bopper had a hit. Um, DJs across the country were beginning to realize that they had a turntable to play their own records on. Mm -hmm. uh, so why not go in and cut a record? Right. So because Kick a Little Foot Sally Ann came out of such a small little independent label, um, uh, Lloyd asked me if I'd write a song for him. Right. Simple so, as that. Simple as that. And that, I mean, you say you're coming out of a small label. I mean, this really was that, in every sense of the word, a garage band, wasn't it? It was literally a homemade uh, whole operation from writing to production to actually getting the, the, the shellac pressed, wasn't it, in those days? It was, but they were impressive because they got they, they got Jack Nietzsche to do the arrangements. Okay, okay. If you get Jack Nietzsche, <laughs> that, yeah. that takes away the whole, uh, the whole uh, onus of being a small little label you think on the mm. cheap. Mm. They didn't do it on the cheap. I mean, they went for the best. They got the best. No, certainly it wasn't yeah. his best. Certainly it wasn't his best. Yeah. Yeah. Never got the kudos that he deserved as well. The spectrum in my opinion. Even, yeah, I agree. To this day, I you agree. Know, but he's a forgotten name is he? to most people on the street. I mean, oh, to most people on the street, yeah. yeah. Most people on the street have trouble remembering their names. Well, this like is now. true. This is true. And give it another generation and they'll forget who as well. <laughs> Um, um, one of my favourite tracks, and we'll probably shoot you down in flames for saying this because it's probably not one of your favourites, is He's My Man by Anne Margaret. Oh, yeah. Uh, which I, I, I you know, when I thought Anne Margaret can't be Anne, can't be Anne Margaret, yeah, but it was, it, it was, was Anne Margaret. Margaret. And there is on there, quite possibly, uh, the first use of the fuzz guitar. Uh, Brian Wilson got credit for introducing the sound on Little Honda, which was basically just a D strung guitar. Um, Lennon was doing that wonderful feedback on the hard drive. You were predating all of these people with the use of feedback. Now, it may have been a happy accident, as you define in your book. I think, I think there is something in the, in, in the wonders of the P.S. Lone Annals, which is going to describe the fact that that was actually an intentional piece of studio manipulation on your part in a very early age. James, it was an intentional... Uh, <coughs> no, it... It, it, <laughs> um, it was a... Uh, First of all, walking, working with Anne Margaret uh, was astounding. 16 years old, um, most gorgeous woman in the world, mm -hmm. mm. and I happen to be a big fan of hers because uh, her record, which went top ten, uh, that Liz record. Do you, you recall the name of it? Um, I just don't understand what it was called. But I just don't understand. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yep. So yep. Yep. It was her first RCA Victor record. It was. So good, so bluesy. Uh, top ten. And to be honest with you, James, I don't know what they were doing asking a 16-year-old kid <laughs> to come and write the follow-up yeah. to yeah. the most beautiful woman in the world with the top mm. ten record. Mm. I don't understand it, but that's the way uh, things work. <clears throat> so I did the best I could. You know, came up with uh, two songs for her, produced them, and during the uh, production of it. Uh, one of the guitar tubes started uh, splitting apart, mm -hmm. and it split apart so perfectly that it, it just fuzzed completely out. And uh, the engineer screamed, "You know what's that? You know, but more can you can you keep it going?" Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's yeah. the first time they'd heard a fuzz, and it wasn't like, "Oh my God, get out of the studio! You know, you're going to ruin the microphones." It wasn't that. It was like, "Can you make it work on cue?" Mm -hmm. That kind of thing. I said, "Yeah, let's try." You know, so I would sit there. Kick the thing, and it, would, uh, so it, it, it might be. I don't know. I, I know that there's a couple of contenders. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's yeah, a happy, happy accident. Yes, yes. very happy accident. Like like most of us. You know, yes, right? quite. You wouldn't have got away with it at, at uh, Abbey Road, that's for sure. Yeah, the white suits, they were, they were, they were, they were, yeah, they were still, oh, kind of bad. Oh, yes. You know, it took them a long time to realize there was more to music than just white suits. Um, we, I don't know, we might be stepping slightly out of time now, but um, you were approached by Bobby Darren, the great Bobby Darren, who at the time was probably at his, probably at his peak, but certainly, certainly heading towards his peak to form a music publishing company with none other than Terry Melcher. Yes. Um, Terry Melcher, for those of you who haven't listened to my Terry Melcher nights, uh, was Doris Day's son. Um, he was a wonderful man, a uh, very good friend of Dennis Wilson's. Um, there are some stories about uh, the pair of them which cannot possibly be repeated at four o'clock in the afternoon. But he was also quite a gifted musician. 
Um, and the idea of the three of you forming something like United Artists but of music would seem too good an opportunity to have passed up. Was it, was it all due to the, uh, how can we say it, the people at Dunhill uh, that uh, it never progressed further than just talking stage? It would have been a fabulous, mm. it would have been a fabulous venture. Um, to have been noticed by Bobby Danner mm. as, a, as an artist and as a songwriter was. Uh, perhaps too much for the people at Dunhill to, uh, to recognize. But basically, from what I understood, they wanted Bobby Darren in their fold. Yeah. And Bobby Darren was there to get me into his, his fold. Yeah. So, you know, that was the first tug of war that was going on. Uh, it, didn't, it didn't develop. But uh, as we know, Bobby went on from that place into folk music. Yes, yeah. And so his heart was in folk music, uh, you know, even when he was doing the uh, uh, bow tie and mm -hmm. tuxedo and everything like that. Would that have given you um, control of your own publishing back then? Had you formed that company with, with and Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. absolutely. Yeah. So they had, they had a lot to lose then by um, letting you walk away into that situation. More than likely, yes. Yeah. Okay. Well, we're going to go on now to, to where where I really discovered you was uh, uh, on the Jan and Dean compilation album my father got for me when I was 13 years old. Uh, and there was, ironically, two baggage tracks on it, one of which was Tell Him I'm Surfing, which... Um, that Jan and Dean did? Yes. Yeah, but our tracks, yeah. Yeah, it was your, it was, it was patently a different sound yeah. to the rest of the tracks on the album. There was something about it that just sounded just not quite Jan and dean to me. Yeah. Uh, and I loved it. And the other track that was on her on it was Anywhere the Girls Are, which had nothing to do with Jan and Dean. I was actually credited to the Fantastic Bangers. Mm. So it was one track on a Jan and Dean, weirdest thing ever, but I loved it. Uh, now it was number one in, correct me if I'm wrong, in Hawaii, Australia, and Indonesia. Mm -hmm. And at the time it was number one in Australia, you were heading off to do the KPOI show in Hawaii. I can remember Brian Wilson, Brian Wilson, one of his moments of fleeting lucidity, uh, was talking about that tour. And he was. So, and yeah. He remembers it. He remembers it. Yeah. And he, what he remembers most is uh, that Jan Berry was there. Uh, and Jan Berry ran out with a can of shaving foam and sprayed Mike right across the face, all over the face, and just ran off stage. Now, the, the boys thought it was funny. Mike went into one of his, I mean, it's not the holy man of rock and roll anymore moods. And Brian says, that's what I remember. Absolutely, you know, but you were you were there. Mm -hmm. um, the baggies were number one, uh, and somehow, for reasons that I still can't fathom out, you weren't allowed to tour as the baggies, and wound up having to play the entire set for everybody else yes. as a bass player. Yes, because I was brought over as a guitar player, but uh, they brought over Glenn Campbell. Okay, and Glenn Campbell. Who's not going to play bass? Mm -hmm. Mike Gamble was going to play guitar, so they were short of bass player. And they asked me, do you know how to play bass? And I watched bass players play, so I figured, yeah, I know how to play bass. So I went to playing for 18 acts, Peter and Gordon, uh, John and Dean, um, the Wellingtons, uh, Ray Peterson, uh, it's a dream come true, it's a rock and roll, it's a rock and roll dream come true, you know. Um, so have you got any fond memories of that tour? Oh yeah, it's the first time I was ever on stage oh, with really? uh, a rock show. Oh, yeah, okay. and I'm playing, my fingers are bleeding. Hal Rivington of the, uh, of the uh, of the Mal Mal fame yeah. turns around and sees my fingers bleeding, you know, and just says, play through, play through. You know, okay. <laughs> okay. Um, in the book, I, the story that, that sticks out was, uh, going outside the auditorium and then being locked out, couldn't get back in. And so Nobody would let me back yeah, in. I remember reading that uh, and, uh, and Carl Wilson shows up and uh, I was good friends with Carl. Mm. And all of a sudden Carl doesn't recognize me. Something, I changed, he changed, I don't know, somebody changed too quickly. Now, he would have bought 64, was that? Late 64, 64 yeah. he would have been, what, 18, yeah. 17, 18? Yeah, yeah. Carl, it's me, Phil. So I don't know if I don't know if Carl, it was just with you in the dressing room. No, you'll have to talk to someone else. 
closes the door. Uh, I'm, I'm hoping he had good luck. I'm hoping he just rolled over the monster. Oh, of course. I'm hoping yeah. that he did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Actually, yeah. that would be a nice thought. That, that would be a, a yeah. yes. That, that would be a nice resolution to that scenario. Yes. And if, yes, that hadn't occurred to me, actually. <laughs> yes. Well, now we're going to go on to something that we actually discussed prior to sitting down, the Tammy Show, and the track, Here They Come From All Over The World. And I was, uh, I was uh, wanting to know about Music City, which was an alternate version with more backing vocals, uh, an entire chorus, let's go down to Music City, let's go down to Music City, uh, underneath the Here They Come From All Over The World. Uh, and lyrical corrections to the third verse, where the, it's the Rolling Stones from London town that are going to be there. Uh, and you actually said that that might have been the original version, because you corrected the lyrics before Jan and Dean actually recorded the thing. There's a blind spot there, James. I'm sorry. But I'm trying to. Uh, I'm trying to. As I was telling James earlier, when he was telling me about uh, this particular thing, there's a blind spot. Uh, as to which actually came first, I'm trying to grab at the clues because London Town, the Rolling Stones from London Town, sounds like well, that's where they're from. So mm. it, it, you know, the original was uh, the Rolling Stones from Liverpool, but uh, you know, I'm having trouble placing that. Um, whether Music City was was the was something that maybe Jan had written. The lyrics that Jan had written? What, well, just the third verse? Um, well, obviously they changed the name from, the name got changed from Music City to Here They Come From All Over The World. Right. I remember coming up with that title and mm -hmm. I remember being excited about it. But I... Well, JJ is, um, Piak is going to sing us a few songs now. Standing over in the corner, Mary's looking for her lover. Went overseas two days ago. I hope she doesn't have to find another. Some say these things will never change, others say they're getting better. Me, I'm standing in the rain. Waiting for a change in the weather no, I'm not saying how I think it should be All I'm saying is that it don't look right to me We gotta try and find a new design We gotta try and find a new design Circle don't bend, don't twist No matter how hard you stretch it God made man to be born free When did he learn to forget it? A dream is a dream if only it's seen Otherwise it's soon forgotten Like an apple sitting in a tree If it's not picked it gets rotten no, I'm not saying how I think it should be All I'm saying is that it don't look right to me No, no, no you Gotta try and find A new design I Gotta try and find
try and understand me You never could do that And in the end you wind up feeling hurt I am a man with too many problems That are pounding on my brain To be a saint My sins they are a many Oh, but there's no one Perfect in this universe And though you think I'm weird Please don't try and fix me, dear Cause if you'll want me You'll take me for what I'm worth Outside my door, there's restlessness within. Oh, I'm like a rain cloud that one day may burst. We both know I'll be leaving, and if one little tear you grieve, oh, that's all right, cause that's all I'm really worth. Think about me in your lonesome hours. Oh, and on your lips there's a sweet word and not a curse. Then I'll be coming back one day when my worry is over. Just still putting pieces together. I'll have to get my detectors on it. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Yeah. I will have to send it to you so you can listen to it at your leisure and try and work out exactly which bits. Because it's definitely been on some of that falsetto and it's definitely patently not on the vast majority of it. That's for sure. It sounds like an early incarnation of the, of the tune. Mm. So it sounds like 90% of it was there, but the they didn't know where they were going with yeah. it. But yeah. the song was there pretty much. Yeah. And yeah, it's an early incarnation of it. Yeah. Um, ironically, with, a, with, with more expansive backing vocals as well. Um, quite why they thin them out. Well, money is no object, and Jan is a perfectionist. Yeah. Uh, so it didn't really matter about money, it was the sound that he wanted. You had to, you had to respect that. Yeah. Because uh, he was, he was um, far from the. Um, the clown that he's portrayed, he was actually quite a meticulous producer, wasn't he? I mean, he even, he even charted his drum tracks, uh, jump charts out, didn't he? Well, m meticulous is is not really quite the right definition. <laughs> uh, uh, a maestro. A, a, right. A, a really teaching Brian Wilson. Uh, you know, where do you think Brian picked up these, mm. these things? It was from Jack. Um, Jan was doing outrageous things. Two drummers, hundreds of limiters, yeah. variations on echoes, variations on sound frequency. This was all new stuff, mm -hmm. you know, way new stuff. And Jan was really into it. No, and you're absolutely right, James. He was he was a clown on the outside, but inside he was a, a lovable tyrant. Right. And, and you loved him because he made great records. If he wasn't making great records, we'd have strung him up like Mussolini. Right, okay. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, don't get me wrong, I absolutely adore Jan and Dean Records, and I don't think me he's too. ever been given the credit he's deserved, simply because there was always a comic angle to the majority of the lyrics, uh, and I think that's been basically a, uh, 
his downfall really in the terms of his legacy. I mean, what he was doing was absolute genius. You look mm. at Dead Man's Curve, the horn arrangements. Mm -hmm. uh, you look at Drag City. There was so much. No, I mean, that was a true production in every sense mm -hmm. of the word. Mm -hmm. You know, and just people say, "Oh, it's not Brian Wilson." You know, as if as if being Jan Berry was not as good as being Brian Wilson. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you get him on the beach, and I don't care what you say, Jan Berry was a prince. Mm -hmm. But uh, that's just me looking back with. Uh, candy colored glasses of a, a year that I wasn't even born in, but all the same. Um, yeah. I'm here to back you up on that. I was there, and I'm telling you what you're saying yourself. Which is lovely to hear, <laughs> which is lovely to hear, because you just have no recognition now, especially amongst, you know, even my generation. But I want to talk about um, Kisses for My Baby, in the Less You Care, which, okay. uh, which doesn't really take us much forward in time. I think we're going to be ending this conversation around about 1965. But you started working with a Canadian uh, mm -hmm. by the name of Terry Black, mm -hmm. uh, who you managed to uh, carry right through to uh, almost Elvis status within his own country. Uh, much to it appears the champion of everybody around you as usual. Mm -hmm. So can you, in the very limited time that we have been allotted, talk us through the, the career of you and Terry Black and see if we can come out the other side with some form of ray of light? Well, yeah, absolutely. Uh, well, let's let's just let's just say that this was a 16-year-old uh, from Canada who had gone in and recorded uh, at a very cheap recording studio with no backing. He did a song called "Them Bones, Them Dry Bones." What the of them bones, them bones, them dry bones? Really? Boom, 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 boom. <laughs> the other side was Cinnamon. Where you gonna run to, what? Cinnamon? And um, it got played on some local radio stations. And just so your listeners know, um, Canada did not embrace the idea of their own artists. They really were Anglophiles, American files, actually. They, they really weren't into their own artists. They, everything American was what they wanted. And uh, it did fairly well in a local market, enough so that the manager thought, you know, I'd like to give this kid a national shot in the United States. He came down, I don't know how he got attached to Dunhill, it worked. <laughs> but uh, I had written a song when I was 16 for Elvis called Unless You Care. Mm -hmm. And it's one of the first songs that I really thought had promise. Uh, simply because it was spilling my heart. Yes. At 16. At 16. That's, yeah. that's, that, you know, it's, uh, it, it's very simple lyric. And it's very easy to go overboard, but it's really my heart in it. Um, and I demoed it for Elvis, and it didn't get very far at all. So when Terry Black came in, um, we were given the assignment of producing him. Yeah. And uh, I wanted Unless You Care. And another song I was working on, Can't Go Somewhere, which is sort of off of a Leonard Bernstein mm -hmm. kind of thing. And got Glock. Got Glenn Campbell. Yes. There's too many Jews in that sense. Yes. Got Glenn. Yes. Got Glenn. Scott Glenn. Got Glenn. Okay, we got Glenn here. But um, we got Glenn in on the electric 12 string. And uh, he came up. But there was a movie called The Blob with Steve yes, McQueen. Yeah, 58, 59. It So uh, Glenn Campbell comes up with the boom. 12 string electric guitar, number one, 14 weeks. Turn the record over, number one, five more weeks. Double sided hit, biggest record Canada had ever had from a, a Canadian artist. Wow. Boom, the Canadian. But the Canadians were not ready to wake up quite yet. Okay. They, 19 weeks out of the year and they're still not ready to wake up. Yes, they're not about to wake up. This is. Uh, so Terry, uh, we come out with his next record, and I wanted to get him away from Elvis. I had heard the Beatles demos, and I, yeah. I knew the Beatles were going to be the biggest thing in the world. Nobody believed in the Beatles, but I did. And I got Terry off of some songs that I wrote, uh, doing some early Beatles songs. Mm -hmm. And those went to number one. Say it again, and everyone can tell. Um, did you offer him Tip of the Tongue? Because that would have been ironic, because that was a title of a McCartney demo from about 19. Yes, yes, I, I <laughs> saw that, yeah. Uh, Tip of My Tongue became uh, what, the, the follow up to uh, uh, Grassroots uh, yeah. Things I Should Have yeah, Said or something yeah, yeah, like yeah. that, um, which was done sort of Mick Jagger It was uh, ironically a Stones type of track exactly, with, with yeah. an old Beatles title of yeah. it. Yeah, no, I don't, think he, of. I don't think he was, I don't think he was off of that. But um, 
I wrote a Medea on the Belmonts kind of thing called mm -hmm. Little Liar, and that went to number one. And what I have to say about every one of those songs were that they were uh, unique in their own way. Little mm -hmm. Liar had this, uh, had this 1959 Dan of the Belmont stomping thing going on. And I'm not that far away from 1959 <laughs> at that point. You know, 1959 is of course. Yeah. just a, a couple of years. heartbeat away yeah, there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So, um, Terry was, Terry was doing fantastic. Uh, as happy as a kid could be, was going to be in an Elvis Presley movie. Oh, really? Yes, he was offered a part in an Elvis Presley movie. Uh, he's going to play Elvis's younger cousin. What a career he would have had. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, I don't think that being in Elvis movies would have really helped anyone's career. Yeah. Yes, in terms of worldwide fame oh, recognition. Of yeah. Yeah. Ricky yeah. Nelson played off of John Wayne. Of course. In Rio fabulous. Bravo. That too. gave him. That's fabulous. Yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah. That's what, why else would you want to watch Glenn John Campbell Wayne? as well. Exactly. Acted off John, Man, uh, John Wayne as well. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So that gave him what's known as credibility, right? Right. And then he ran into trouble. He, he wanted money. He wanted to get paid. Yes. Oh, yes. heavens. You actually think that this comes with money, do you? No, 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 no. So sorry. Yeah. And. Uh, that uh, that forced him to leave, and uh, took him years to get over it mm -hmm. because they treated him very badly. Mm -hmm. They treated him like almost everybody badly. Um, but he came back in 1979, got a, a song yes. in Meatballs, which was uh, a great movie. And uh, kids of my age. And uh, a friend of a friend who lived in Canada, who was is now married to Brian's ex-wife, Marilyn. Oh, okay, Daniel. Daniel. Yes. You know Daniel? Daniel. Yes. Okay. Yes. yes. So Daniel. Uh, Daniel Rutherford. Daniel Rutherford. Yes. Mm. Daniel Rutherford uh, belied and bemoaned the fact that Terry's album is not out there. Black Plague is not out there. It's right. being bootlegged for twenty years. Mm. Terry is not making any money at all. Yeah. And uh, you know we we tried for seven years to track down Tolly to track down. Uh, ARC records. And yeah. They said no, all the masters are gone, they've been burned, they've been thrown away, and we, I just wouldn't accept that. Mm. Just kept persisting and persisting. Oh, finally, the janitor walked into the janitor's closet. Oh, my God, these are Sherry Black uh, tapes. Wow. So they remastered them, they put them out. Uh, it was an instantaneous success. I mean, it was like five, six number, eight, six, seven number one records on there. With, yeah. with uh, and uh, Sherry's career took off again. He became a huge star in Canada, going on concert tours, he got his own radio show, he right. disc jockey. He got the respect that he that he had been yeah, denied. 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 Um, so we are taking the same to wind up because we're not even we haven't even we haven't even we we're, haven't, we're going to we don't want to stop. We haven't even got down to discussing um, sins of the family or what's the matter with me yet. We're still stuck in late 64, but um, Sangeeta, Sangeeta is watching the clock more let's rapidly than I am. Let's finish late 1964. Okay. okay. Late 1964. We, okay. Will, we will throw in um, just, uh, obviously we have to mention what's the matter with me because it now is the title of your just released autobiography. Um, a wonderful Dylan-esque, I should say, probably Guthrie-esque lyric. Uh, written at a very young age uh, and as um, insightful as probably Carry That Weight was from McCartney who wrote that at the age of 26 or whatever. So, Thank you. just um, can you just quickly talk us through what that song meant to you when you wrote it? Because it, I mean, it's an incredibly so insightful song for a young man. Uh, thank you. Uh, and it, it, it's uh, thank you for putting uh, attention on, on that song because you have to understand that up until that time I'm writing surf songs. Mm. And mm. uh, the, for this to come through me, uh, and I'm by no means stupid. I, I'm no means a Rhodes Scholar, but I, I have a fairly good mind. I have a, a fairly intelligent output and a fairly intelligent uh, heart. When this came through me, I recognized it as something special, mm -hmm. something that I instantaneously recognized as having meaning. Um, you know, you can write a, a, a Terry Black unless you care at 16 and say to yourself, that has meaning. Yes, and I so I'm going to continue being a songwriter. Maybe I can I can hit that again. Uh, with what's exactly the matter with me came through me. 
I was ready to devote the rest of my life to. Was that the first P.F. Sloan song? The very first was uh, was Eve. But it was the same night. Yes. It was, it was the same night. There were five songs in that night. Uh, What's Exactly the Matter with Me struck me exactly where I wanted to be, Guthrie-esque, and yet not in the 30s or the 40s, mm. but, but right now. Mm. And I realized that there was some poetic spirit that was found me worthy as an instrument or as a voice. So I wanted to be open to that. That was... Uh, that was something I wanted to hitch my uh, my life to, yeah. if I could. And it was at that point that um, you felt that P.S. Sloan was a, a conduit for that spirituality. That from that moment onwards, you became so much more than I the needed. Sloan yeah. and Barry type of I needed to machine. protect. I needed to protect that. Yeah. I needed to protect that. I needed to keep that away the best I could. Keep that away from being corrupted. Mm. Uh, and couldn't quite succeed. In doing that, but you have time has time has shown that it has really borne fruit. The song stands up as great now as it ever was, um, and obviously has led itself to being the title of your wonderful autobiography. I want to take this opportunity to thank you hugely on behalf of all my listeners, and even greater for me because it's been a, a lifelong ambition to have had the opportunity to speak to you. Um, could so now we can all die? Well, absolutely. I can die happy now. So that to Jules the other day, she says, well, get some royalties in first. But, uh, you. you. know, we got as far as 1964 on a life, and we've still got 50 years to go. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much for Thank coming. You, it's been an absolute joy. Likewise. And uh, if you would sign my little poster here, with a memory of my day, I can then, because we've just done one just, just for you for the day. Thank you, sir. The and Jules and I have done one for you too. Oh, thank so you. So you've got a, a little memento of your your trip to sunny London town. I think that will fit exactly in my carry-on case. You think? <laughs> <laughs> well, well, JJ, is we're going to play some more wonderful P.S. Sloan. There we go. Well, we're off for an Indian dinner. I know you are. I know you are. Give my love to your fans. Tell them I'd be ignored.